So Dr. Scholz, today we're talking about chemotherapy within prostate cancer. I think when people think about cancer, chemotherapy is often synonymous with that. They think of that as the automatic treatment. However, chemotherapies in prostate cancer actually work differently than most cancers. Can you explain why? Well, historically, the chemotherapies that were available for prostate cancer were not that effective. Um, also, it wasn't as big a priority because hormonal therapy is so amazingly effective in prostate cancer. So, uh, so its role is much smaller than it is in other cancers. Before a lot of the new hormonal therapies were developed, chemotherapy was uh, even more prominent than it is today. Now we're getting such great results with first and second generation hormonal therapy, the role for chemotherapy has been for further diminished. Uh, what has changed, though, is uh, certain studies that have come out over the last uh, few years showing that in people that have the more worrisome types of prostate cancer, the combination of first, second generation hormone therapies with chemo gives even higher cure rates than uh, just the first and second generation hormonal therapies alone. So there has been a little bit of a resurgence in the importance of chemotherapy for prostate cancer as a result of these newer studies. So when we're talking about first and second generation hormone therapies, we're talking about like maybe Lupron and Zytiga or Xtandi and then doing like something like Jeftana and Taxentera on top of it? Yeah, so just to be clear, so first generation hormonal therapies are things that block uh, testosterone production from the testicles. Second generation hormone therapies block testosterone production from the cancer cell itself. Chemotherapies, which are really limited to Taxotere and Jeftana, which are very similar uh, with each other, uh, that pretty much encompasses mainstream chemotherapy for prostate cancer. So what stages of prostate cancer are eligible for chemotherapies? There's two broad sweeping roles for chemotherapy uh, consideration. Uh, one is in people that have tried second-generation hormone therapies, their PSA is rising, the cancer is progressing, and uh, the things that are considered at that juncture are things like Zofigo, Lutetium, which is recently approved, um, Taxotere, uh, Provenge, and, uh, and the like. But there's also another situation where people are recently diagnosed and they have some sort of metastatic disease, either in the lymph nodes or the bones, and studies are now showing that if you jump on it aggressively with first and second generation hormonal therapies and, uh, and then ad add a course of chemotherapy, Taxotere Jeftana, for four to six cycles, that their long-term survival will be improved. So when it comes to PSMA and the advent of it, are we seeing that more patients will be on early use of chemotherapy since we're able to pick up these metastatic lesions faster? You would think so, but no, I don't. I don't anticipate that in the um, in the milieu of of a surgeon dominated disease the way prostate cancer is. We don't have uh, strong literature yet uh, the supporting that concept. the The literature uh, supporting the idea idea of e early chemotherapy is based on lymph nodes or bone mats that were detected by older scans, bone scans and CAT scans. So that's a more established, uh, somewhat more progressed type of cancer and perhaps easier to justify using chemotherapy. The, the, the policy of using um, chemotherapy in conjunction with very small metastases that are detected on PSMA PET scan is still not established and I think that would be a very individualized situation. So when it comes to the effects of the chemotherapies and side effects, what should a patient expect? i say that the most prominent thing with Taxotere and Jevtana, and I kind of like to talk about the names of the medicines because when you talk about chemotherapy, the type of therapy that's given to lung cancer, breast cancer, colon cancer is decidedly more toxic. Uh, it's, they give higher doses and multiple agents, whereas with prostate cancer, it's just one medicine and somewhat diminished doses, and generally it's pretty well tolerated. These medicines are infused every three weeks for a total of four to six treatments, and uh, by far and away, the most prominent side effect is to feel tired for three to five days, sort of a mild flu-y feeling uh, after each cycle. There can be some hair loss. Uh, there, precautions need to be taken against nausea and low blood counts, but uh, there are effective medicines that counteract those problems. 
You know, we talk about Jovtana and Taxotere. I know one question I see in our comment section a lot is which one is better. So you mentioned dosage. Can you explain uh, the dosing of both and then if you see any benefit to either? Well, they're both given every three weeks and, uh, and there is some flexibility in the dosing, but it's pretty standardized. There are relatively few differences between the medicines in the sense that they are based on the same molecule with, with some very slight modifications. I, there are head-to-head -head studies published of Taxotere and Jeftana, and they're equally effective at killing cancer. It appears that, in general, Jeftana is a little better tolerated, has somewhat fewer side effects. So uh, I think when there's an option, uh, I would probably lean towards using the Jeftana rather than the Taxotere. Sometimes because Taxotere is generic, certain insurance companies will insist on Taxotere uh, for cost reasons. but. Uh, if I had uh, the freedom to choose, I would probably lean toward the Jeftana. What is the duration of treatment? Is a patient going to be on chemo for a year, 18 months, six months? What does that look like? As I mentioned before, the idea of giving four to six cycles is sort of an empiric protocol that is used for people with uh, newly diagnosed prostate cancers where we're trying to enhance cure rates or enhance survival. But if someone is taking these medicines as a backup procedure where the hormonal therapy has stopped working and, uh, and we're moving on now to try and control a cancer that's not been controlled with hormone therapy, so-called hormone-resistant prostate cancer. Usually the protocol is to take two cycles of Jeftana or Taxotere, see if the PSA is dropping, see if scans are improving or not, and then also assess how well the patient is tolerating the medicine, and then use that information to decide how much further to go. If people are responding to the medicine, then of course you would proceed on as long as there's not excess side effects. I've had men on these medicines for as long as two or three years. Uh, that's not a common thing, but certain individuals tolerate the medicine extremely well, and it turns out to be very effective for those people. The overall sense of success with these medicines in people that have um, become hormone resistant, it's probably about two out of three patients will get some benefit, and one out of three patients will probably get dramatic benefit, and then one out of three patients probably isn't going to work very well. So you'll be able to tell within two or at the most three cycles of administered chemotherapy whether or not the agent is working in that specific individual or not. So in certain prostate cancer treatments, you know, maybe with surgery, you're going to see a sharp PSA decline with radiation. We see it up to two or three years, two typically. What would the PSA decline look like? You said after two or three cycles, you would see it. So what would that decline look like over time? Well, it just depends on how well that individual is responding to the treatment because some prostate cancers are uh, very sensitive to uh, Taxotere and Jevtana. Other prostate cancers doesn't seem to phase them. I remember we had a patient uh, early on when we were starting to use um, uh, Taxotere whose PSA was over a thousand and within uh, six months his PSA had dropped down to less than one. So uh, it is quite possible for these medicines to have dramatic uh, effect with, with cancer reversals that are really meaningful. And then uh, sometimes that can happen quickly, sometimes it happens a little more slowly. Uh, and then, of course, in other individuals, it doesn't seem to work very well. I mean, you must have treated hundreds, if not a couple thousand patients with, you know, chemotherapy by this point. Have you seen, like, true absolute remissions for these patients? Yes. Yeah, people can uh, obtain undetectable PSA, which is what we call a complete remission. I'd say that the remissions tend to be sort of like hormonal therapy. They're fantastic while the patients are taking the medicine and then for a certain period afterwards, but after you stop the medicines, then the cancers usually tend to start growing back. With that being said, if you've done chemo once, can you do it again? Yes, there is a literature for intermittent chemotherapy, just like there's a literature for intermittent hormonal therapy. And it makes sense because the cumulative side effects of chemotherapy, tiredness, can become more prominent as people have more cycles of treatment. To take a holiday for a while if the medicine has been working very well is quite logical. And then if the PSA starts coming up again, then to resume the the medicine after the patient has had some time for rest. How long do those intermittent chemotherapy sessions usually go? Is it like a couple years where you've seen patients maybe take a couple cycles, take a break, take a couple cycles and take a break? Or is there a certain definite time you would stop? I'd say that in treating hormone resistant advanced prostate cancers that 
the holidays are going to often be relatively short. The chemotherapy is what keeps the, those serious diseases in check. And uh, if, if you stop it for three to six to nine months, I would consider that a success and uh, with the expectation that the PSA is going to be coming up again and that you're going to have to go back on the treatment. Now, going back to side effects, you know, we've talked about the different side effects. You mentioned fatigue and balding, you know, that type of thing. Are there any tips and tricks that you've learned in your practice over the years of giving Joftana and Taxotere that you've seen be very effective to help mitigate these? Well, for the fatigue, just like with hormonal therapy, fitness counteracts fatigue to a great degree, and it's a hard thing to ask someone who already feels tired to exercise, but it makes a big difference, and it should be done. The hair loss can be uh, counteracted with um, with ice caps. Uh, these are covered by insurance and are somewhat expensive for breast cancer patients. They're typically not covered by insurance for prostate cancer patients, but they do work. We tell patients to put ice chips in their mouths to circulate blood away from the taste buds on our tongues, which are also sensitive to the chemotherapy. So people don't do this. They say that food tastes metallic and whatnot when they're on the chemotherapy. So by putting ice chips on the tongue, the chemotherapy exposure to the taste buds is minimized and, uh, and you can sidestep that problem. There are medicines to keep the immune system strong during chemotherapy, uh, Nulasta and other products. Um, we use them routinely. It surprises me sometimes that other oncologists wait till people get an infection and then they implement them, which sounds dangerous to me. I, I, I wouldn't advocate that. The other uh, side effects, sometimes people can get some numbness in their uh, fingers or down in their toes that we don't really have a effective way to counteract that. And if it gets serious, we have to stop the chemotherapy. Chemotherapy can, uh, or taxotere and Jeftana can cause a, a anemia in some patients and that can be counteracted with medications as well. When people think of chemotherapy, they think of problems with nausea. And that is a problem that's been pretty much solved now with the modern anti-nausea medicines. So uh, the fears about nausea, for the most part, are um, no, no longer uh, a concern. We're very grateful for those medications because prior to the advent of modern anti-nausea medicines, uh, nausea was a very big problem. Now as far as these side effects go, which ones last past the actual treatment, like getting the treatment, and how long does it take for the effects to taper off? So if someone takes four to six cycles of treatment and then stops or takes a holiday, the, uh, the tiredness is uh, something that may take uh, a week or two to go away. But after that, uh, you know, you your weight uh, recovery of hair growth, and uh, the problems with the uh, nerve uh, issues in the fingertips and toes where you get numbness, that can last sometimes for months. In summary, it sounds like there's two different roles for chemotherapy and prostate cancer then. It sounds like you're saying that with high-grade disease where there's metastatic activity and people are still hormone sensitive, that they can be on hormone therapy and take chemotherapy, and so that's a whole different category for itself. And then we have hormone-resistant prostate cancer where chemotherapy is typically thought of and that people need to remember it can be used in both categories. Yes, and I think that it's good to realize that there's, um, there are different goals. With the recently diagnosed high-grade cancers, the goal for the chemotherapy is to try and actually cure the disease. Whereas in our patients that have hormone resistant disease that have been on hormone treatment a long time, their cancer has been progressing over a number of years, and now they're going on chemotherapy, our goal there is to prolong survival. Prolonging survival is a, is a you know, wonderful effect from these powerful medicines, uh, but it's basically pushing off the inevitable because we're dealing with a, with a fatal disease. In the newly diagnosed, or the people that have these high-grade cancers that are spread uh, after, soon after the discovery of the disease, cure rates can Im be improved uh, maybe 10 to 15 percent. So what we're talking about is someone taking surgery or radiation plus first and second generation hormone therapy, say they have lymph node disease, and uh, they go through all that treatment and we project based on the profiles that we have from thousands of patients that have treated, maybe their cure rate will be 60 percent. Uh, with radiation plus first and second generation hormone therapy, whereas if they add four to six cycles of taxotere jeftana, their cure rate may be projected to be 70%. We select out these newly diagnosed patients with high-grade disease based on how much their cure rate will be enhanced with the treatment, and then, of course, people have to count the cost in terms of the side effects and inconvenience and whatnot. So it's an analysis I think needs to be done in all patients with newly diagnosed high-grade or early metastatic disease. Unfortunately, 
it often doesn't even come up for discussion. And people are missing out on something that can uh, possibly lead to a higher cure rate. Thanks so much for watching. If you would like more information about prostate cancer and all sorts of education, you can visit our website, pcri.org, and subscribe to our YouTube channel. We come out with new prostate cancer education videos every week.